Stockplay of the Day is an educational program. Any statements made by Ally Invest employees are not intended to be or should be considered investment advice, a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security, or a recommendation to adopt an investment strategy. Welcome to the Stock Play of the Day. Today's stock is FedEx, symbol FDX. We'll discuss should we pass or should we play? Hello, my name is Brian Overby. I am the Senior Options Analyst with Ally Invest. And I'm Callie Cox, Senior Investment Strategist at Ally Invest. And I'm filling in for Lindsay Bell this week. All right, Kelly. Well, I have a chart of the S&P 500 index. We saw some mixed trading last week. What do you see going into the markets this week? Well, Brian, there is a lot to talk about today. So, yes, the S&P 500 was pretty mixed last week, a lot of up and down. But overall, we did see a lot of volatility last week. And, you know, looking at today, there's not a lot going on in headlines. You're seeing a little bit of M&A, um, a little bit of positive vaccine news. But overall, we're seeing a big relief rally in the S&P 500. Last I checked, the S&P 500 was up about 1.5%. Um, so definitely not the kind of weakness we saw last week on the down days. But we're not out of the woods yet. So let's talk a little bit about last week, because like I said, one of the wildest weeks we saw since March. Stocks had a pretty volatile week. Um, the S&P 500 trading in a pretty wide range. You know, so far, we've seen the S&P 500 fall about 7% from a record high. You know, 7% is pretty typical. Um, we see quite a few 5 to 10% uh, pullbacks every year, so even in healthy years, even in years when the market rallies a lot. Um, so, you know, right now, we think this, this is looking pretty typical. Uh, we're seeing a typical, typical market correction. Um, so we're not too worried, but, you know, the volatility is pretty disconcerting. It's hard to watch the screens and see, you know, stocks move one and a half percent, two percent a day. So we definitely, um, we definitely feel you there. Um, it's, it's tough to watch, you know, a market like this. But overall, we're feeling pretty good about where we are and how the market's moving and today's relief rally makes us feel a little bit better. Um, you know, Lindsay and I are feeling very constructive on stocks right now. Um, you know, we didn't see a lot of news to start the sell off to begin with. And I know you can point to a lot of different reasons why stocks should be lower than they are right now. But there is no big reason why stocks are selling off now. And that's the important part. Why are they selling off now? There's no big catalyst, which makes us think it is a very typical you know, the market has run too far. So maybe it'll pull back a little bit. One of those typical types of sell off. We're also watching tech stocks pretty closely. I mean, everybody's watching tech stocks pretty closely. But, you know, tech stocks have gotten pummeled in this sell off. You know, the NASDAQ just suffered its quickest correction ever. And correction, when we say correction, we mean a 10% decline from its 52 week high. Um, so, yeah, tech stocks are really getting, really taking it on the chin. But that's encouraging to us. And I know it sounds kind of weird, but it's encouraging when you look at the overall market because tech was the winner um, going through the recovery. You know, tech stocks, everybody heard about them. Tech stocks did really well on the way up. So now that we're seeing tech stocks do poorly, leave the market lower, we look at the market and we say, hmm, okay, this looks like a profit taking kind of sell off. And that's the sell off you want to see, you know, after a really long, you know, strong rally that we've seen over the past few months, it makes sense for investors to kind of take some profits in the stocks that have done well. And that's exactly what we're seeing, Brian. Um, so, you know, let's think about this week a little bit. Uh, you know, we've had a few like pretty quiet weeks on the economic front. So we're going to see economic reports pick up a little bit this week. You know, we have the Fed most notably on Wednesday um, with their scheduled September meeting. Um, so on Wednesday, you can expect a policy announcement from the Fed. That's, you know, an announcement on rates and bond buying, you know, the things that we've really been watching closely since March, and we watch closely anyway. Um, but the Fed will have a scheduled policy announcement. Fed Chair Powell will have a scheduled press conference, and the Fed is scheduled to release their economic and rate projections. And you know investors are going to be watching that closely. Um, like I said, we've been watching the Fed very closely since March because Fed has, the Fed has been one of the big reasons why 
we've seen markets rally and, you know, be durable like they are right now. Um, so the Fed has to be really careful in how it, uh, you know, kind of views policy and talks about policy because investors are going to pick their words apart a little bit. And if the Fed says something wrong, if Powell can't walk that line, then we might see a sell-off, especially right now um, when investors are a little bit more nervous. So definitely watch out for the Fed on Wednesday. And later in the week, we do have a retail sales report on Wednesday. Um, it's the August retail sales report, followed by some housing data towards the end of the week. We're going to see building permits and housing starts, um, two very important housing reports. They are leading indicators. So we should get some signs on the health of the consumer later this week. Another big thing to watch in the economic recovery, because the consumer makes up about 70% of GDP growth normally. Um, so definitely some things to watch this week. Uh, Brian, as for today, I'm actually watching the VIX quite a bit, because believe it or not, the VIX is down today, down a little bit to about 26 showing that options traders are breathing a sigh of relief. You know, what are you seeing, Brian? Well, I have my little watch list that I keep on the VIX up. And yes, the VIX is down because we've actually seen some counterintuitive moves in the VIX where we've had some big up days and we've seen implied volatility increase. And that was happening a lot over the last few weeks. Well, today it's kind of nice to see that we actually do have an update in the S&P 500 index. And we see the VIX index right now, and I'm highlighting it on my screen, is trading at uh, 25.70. It's down $1.17 today. And that's that just kind of means that people are feeling a little bit more comfortable about the move to the upside. But I do want to highlight, and I mentioned this on our, our last stock play of the day a couple of weeks back, that the October and November volatilities, the futures that actually kind of track the, the, the VIX index that actually the options that trade are based off of, um, the October volatility is still over 30% and the November is right at 30%. So going into the election, that nervousness is still there. The marketplace is expecting more volatility than less based off of where the uh, VIX is at right now. Then we get into December and January, and, uh, and now we kind of see the VIX volatility index actually going down a little bit, which uh, overall, that's still good, but it's still quite high. Uh, looking at January of next year, we're seeing 28% uh, implied volatility in the futures contracts on, the, on that VIX index. And I actually have a little chart here on the VIX, and we see that normally before the pandemic, we see where the volatility is at, right down around 15% was probably the mean, maybe 16% implied volatility in the VIX. So we definitely have a very nervous market, even though we're setting new highs in a lot of these places, volatility is still increased. It just highlights the nervousness and the ex expectation of volatile markets. Now, I wanna emphasize that when we talk about volatility, we're not necessarily saying to the downside, volatility is to the upside too, uh, it has no regard to direction, but the marketplace is expecting more volatility going into uh, finishing out September and going into October. All right. Now, uh, with that said, I also wanted to highlight on the NASDAQ, uh, Kelly was talking a little bit about the, 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 the selling pressures in the NASDAQ. And we see here from the chart that we have a little bit of a channel that we actually a couple of years back. And we did break out that through that channel. We, we came through it pretty hard. Markets now are trying to decide which way they want to go. It looks like the 50-day moving average is providing a little bit of an area of support. Uh, if the marketplace does break down through that, then obviously the next one that, that we kind of like to highlight here is the 200-day moving average. But we've definitely broken the uptrend based off of the channel that was so strong since that uh, March downturn and the March lows overall. So with that said, a little bit on the NASDAQ chart and also on the VIX index, I'll pass it back to you. Today's stock is FedEx. What do we see in FedEx going forward? Sure. Thanks, Brian. And thanks for the rundown. Definitely a lot of things to watch today. So as Brian mentioned, our stock play of the day is FedEx. And you say, what? Why FedEx? Well, we have a pretty compelling story for you. So we all know FedEx, it's that big global shipping company that drops off packages at your door. Or maybe you go to FedEx yourself and you mail off packages and letters to your loved ones. In a normal world, this global shipping industry tends to be cyclical, meaning it does better when the economy does better. It tends to follow the economy, in other words. This time is a little bit different, though. 
you know, the economy is growing, but it's had a rough year. Um, however, you know, FedEx and UPS, other shipping companies, have performed really well, even though we've seen an economic recession. That's weird. Like I said, it's a cyclical stock. It tends to perform well when the economy is performing well and poorly when the economy is performing poorly. So why is that the case? Well, you know, COVID forced us to, you know, think more in an online manner. And when you're staying at home, maybe you order more things to be shipped to your house. You know, maybe you uh, shop on Amazon a little bit more. Well, that benefits the people who bring those packages to your door. And we're talking FedEx. Um, and there's another plot twist here. I'm sure you've seen headlines about the Postal Service. Um, there seems to be some turbulence with the government funding around the Postal Service. So the Postal Service may be in trouble going forward. That's a developing story. But that could be good news for FedEx. That could force companies and individuals to use other mailing services beside the Postal Service. So FedEx stock. FedEx stock has actually been one of those sneaky performers. Everybody talks about tech stocks. Even I have talked about tech stocks in this episode as being one of the leaders of the recovery. But FedEx stock has done really well and hasn't gotten a lot of attention. FedEx stock has jumped 39% since the end of July. And that's when speculation around the Postal Service's troubles started flaring up. For comparison, the S&P 500 has risen just 2% over the same period. So FedEx has blown the S&P 500 out of the water. Um, and, you know, FedEx has earnings coming up tomorrow, too, which, you know, is another really interesting plot twist. And I think Brian's going to talk about it when he introduces the trade. But FedEx earnings are coming up. Uh, FedEx is reporting earnings for the most recent quarter tomorrow after the market closed. That quarter is FedEx's first fiscal quarter. It's a little off cycle compared to other companies. Um, so that first quarter was from the beginning of June until the end of August. Um, just letting you know what the time frame is. So you can think about where the world was during those few months. Analysts are predicting FedEx's profit fell 15% year over year in the last quarter. And while that sounds bad on the face, it's actually not that bad compared to other companies and how they performed in the second quarter. Um, after all, S&P 500 profits fell about 33% in the second quarter. So now that 15% drop doesn't look so bad, does it? Um, basically, it's been a really bad time for most companies, and it hasn't been easy for FedEx, but FedEx has done well relative to other companies, and that seems to be what matters for the markets these days. And, you know, like I said, these days it's all about expectations. It may not matter how much profits slide as long as they beat Wall Street's expectations. And when I talk about Wall Street, I'm talking about the analysts who issue price stocks and reports on different companies, individual stocks, FedEx is what I'm talking about. It's kind of like a mind game. In the past two quarters, FedEx earnings have dropped year over year, but they were better than what Wall Street has expected. And that's been enough for shareholders. And this is really important because FedEx shares popped 12% after its last earnings report, even though profits fell year over year. The quarter before, the stock popped 5% after earnings were released, even though, again, profits fell year over year. Why did that happen? Because Wall Street expected them to fall more, and, you know, shareholders weren't expecting that. So it was almost like, you know, the profit drop, while not as bad as expected, kind of encouraged shareholders that maybe we were, you know, coming out of the woods a little bit. So for what it's worth, the earnings bar for FedEx, the Wall Street earnings bar, is sitting at $2.69 right now, according to Bloomberg, Bloomberg Survey of Analysts. So that's the bar that we're watching. And for me, I'll be watching FedEx's earnings to see if they exceed that bar or if they maybe miss that bar, because I think that that's going to be a big key to how the stock reacts. Um, there are also things, other things to watch, like management guidance um, in the call. You know, maybe management doesn't throw out any uh, specific, like, number guidance, but they might talk about, you know, different things. You know, they might hint, uh, you got to watch the words a little bit. Um, it, it all just depends on the tone. Um, so management is another thing to watch, especially these days when we have no idea what tomorrow is going to look like. Um, you know, that's, that's all going to be really interesting. But the earnings bar is what we are going to watch. Um, that's the primary thing that we are looking for in FedEx earnings. And I know Brian's been doing a lot of research on FedEx stock. So, Brian, I want to hear what you're seeing in FedEx options. But before we get back to you, 
I'll remind our viewers to please drop your questions in the chat because we'll be answering them live at the end of the show. So you have questions? We hopefully have answers because we're trying to figure things out too. Anyway, Brian, tell us about the trade. All right, so uh, once again, whenever we're talking about these strategies, they're not meant to be recommendations. We're just trying to learn here on the stock play of the day. But if I look at my, my chart here, we're uh, seeing some interesting movement. Obviously, this move that Kelly has mentioned going all the way back to July has been parabolic to the upside. And that always makes you a little bit nervous overall. But one so good sign that we see on the chart here is that if I highlight this area right around 233 on the chart and I go all the way back to 2018, that's when we saw a big downturn in FedEx and actually kind of started a little bit of a, a bear market going in from 2019 all the way out to 2020. Now, obviously, we we're getting a lot more of a movement to the upside, a lot to do with what's going on in the world right now, but we are actually breaking through that section right now at uh, 2031 is where we had a little bit of a breakout today in that underlying stock. And overall, that's just a good thing uh, to the upside. It just shows a little bit more momentum on the underlying stock, even though the stock is a little bit frothy. So what are we gonna do in the options world going into earnings? This is obviously gonna be an earnings play per se, it's gonna be an earnings paper trade. And because we've had a fairly big move up and the stock is a fairly high price stock, we're definitely going to be selling some option contracts. So in this instance, uh, we're looking at buying a call and selling a call against that position going into earnings. It's going to be speculating on the, the earnings event that is happening. And a little bit, uh, sometimes you get a little, what makes you a little bit nervous is that we've had such a good run up. A lot, some people might do the old uh, sell, buy the rumor, sell the news scenario. So even you gotta be a, cognizant of that, uh, that, that scenario actually playing out. So with that said, we want to be we want to use options on a conservative basis to manage our risk going into this earnings event. All right. So here's the long call spread in the Ally Invest Options playbook. We're going to be doing an out of the money long call spread. That means that on the stock price right now, the stock price would be below strike A. We're going to buy a little bit out of the money option contract and then sell a little bit further out of the money option contract. So let's look at the FedEx Ally Invest option chains. And I'm going to highlight right now that it is up almost 1% today. And it had a good run up last Friday, too. So we're up $2.36. Here's the highlight. We're highlighting the earnings is going to be on the 15th uh, after the close. Now, to start with, whenever I'm looking at doing a strategy around earnings, I want to know uh, what the marketplace is thinking the potential move could be. So, and how do we do that? Well, we just look at the most at the money long straddle for the nearest term expiration date. So if I look at this uh, going four days away, which obviously we got all day tomorrow for them to trade to before that earnings report comes in, uh, this the option contract with four days to expiration, if we buy, it's uh, 234.95, so you can't, 235 is definitely the most at the money. Buying that option contract on the call side, buying it on the put side, we see that that's trading for about Let's just call it 24 bucks right around there. Uh, 24 bucks is about 10%. So uh, the expected move is somewhere around 10%. It's not an exact science, but I want to keep that in mind. So if we add 24 to where the current underlying stock is, the 260 strike is in play, basically. That's what the marketplace is saying. It's not saying uh, in regards to direction, but they're saying that that is a move that would be feasible in FedEx after earnings based off of the news. So that's a plausible move. So let me clear this out and let's get to this week's paper trade. We're gonna go out a little bit further in time. That's the short-term expiration there. I'm gonna go out 11 days, just give us a little bit more time for this trade to play out. And we're gonna be buying an option and selling another option contract. And we wanna make sure the one that we're selling is below with the 260 strike. In other words, we want to we want to sell an option contract that the underlying stock could get to based off of the forces in the options marketplace, what the options marketplace is saying overall. So we're just going to do a five point wide spread. We're going to buy the 240 strike and we're going to 245. I'm sorry, 245 strike on the call side. 
over here. So we're going to buy the 245 strike, and then we're going to sell the 250 strike. Okay. How do I do that in the LI Invest Options Trading Platform? We use the calls. The calls are on the left hand side, the puts are on the right hand side. We see the underlying stock is at 235. This is where it's at. We go up a few strikes. It's a potential move based off of where the long straddle is trading at, it says it could go up to 260. We're going to pick somewhere in the middle. We're going to do the 245, sell the 250, five points wide, and we're only going to risk a dollar 63 on this trade so we've got five points of upside the maximum that this trade that the spread could trade for is the difference between the strikes which is five points and we're going to pay a dollar 63 for that so that will be the official paper trade that dollar 63 will be uh our maximum risk on this trade so like i said it's a speculative trade we want to manage our risk and how are we going to do that these are really expensive option contracts so we're going to be doing it by buying an option contract and selling a, uh, another option contract higher. Because if we're just buying this call outright, we're looking at uh, $9.85 on the ass. So that's $985 to just buy one call option to speculate on the upside. Now we're going to cap our upside. We're saying if it goes above 250, we're not going to play anymore, right? We have limited and known upside on it. Uh, but we're going to sell that option contract, and that on the bid is trading for around 790, 790 dollars for one option contract. So we manage our risk. Uh, this is basically going to be well, did it make it or didn't it, right? If not, it's going to be somewhere in between the strikes, between 245 or 250. But uh, we're we're managing our risk going into this earnings e event by doing the long spread. All right, so we're gonna have 11 days to the expiration. So if they're gonna announce earnings, you still got a few days after, we're gonna let this trade play out. Um, if you want to, if they announce earnings and they're not good and there's still some value in the spread, you can sell it and get out of it, try to salvage whatever you can. But we're hoping that it will open to the upside and it will go over the next couple of, well, next 11 days that it can actually break through the 250 level. So let's make it the official paper trade for the week. I'm just gonna click trade here and then put this in the right rail. Uh, and we see that we're buying to open one of the SEP 25, 245 calls, and then selling against it one of the SEP 25 expiration 250 calls. Uh, we'll, we'll try that for a midpoint, Phil. When we're looking at, we're saying 163. Well, 165 is the midpoint. I think that that's fair right there, that you'd want to work this order. You can never guarantee a midpoint, Phil, on the trade. But that will be our official paper trade for the week. Max risk. If you do this one by one, uh, if you're doing one buying one option contract and selling one option contract at the same time, would be $165 plus commission or a dollar sixty-five net debit for that spread overall. All right. So now I'm just going to highlight before I pass it back to Kelly and see if we have any questions out there. If you have any, please put them in the chat box. And we'll address them. I just want to highlight the profit and loss graph here uh, inside the Ally Invest option chains. We see. What I, I kind of like this because it shows you the type of move that you that you're looking for. Underlying stock trading right around 235. It's highlighted by this white line. This is what the profit and loss graph looks like right now. So there's not a lot of risk right now. Uh, in, in that we don't have a lot of momentum if the market goes up or goes down because this is this colored line is showing as of right now. But what will happen is we have very expensive option contracts after earnings are announced, implied volatilities kind of come down. And as expiration approaches, you're gonna see this line look more like the dotted line at expiration. So let's let's wipe out quite a few days and regraph it. And now you see the line starting to bend a little bit more like the profit and loss graph at expiration. All right. So that's going to be the paper trade for this week. I'm going to pass it back to Callie and ask her, Callie, do we have any questions in that chat box? All right, Brian. Thanks for the rundown there. Uh, let me check. I know I'm seeing a few good questions. Oh, by the way, like Brian said, it's not too late. If you have any questions, drop them in the chat and we might get to them before the end of the show. All right. So I'm seeing a question from Ramya. Ramya? Hi, Ramya. Um, I'm sorry if I pronounced that weird. Uh, so Ramya says, options versus traditional trading. What's your suggestion for a beginner with a couple of months of trading experience? You know, Brian, maybe tell us about some good ways for beginners to dip their toes into options. Well, 
a, a good way is to, to watch shows like this and legitly paper trade these trades that we talk about. The stock play of the day is all about learning. We're going to talk about why are we doing this spread here as opposed to just buying an option contract outright. And then you want to see, well, how did the market react after the trade was placed? Uh, go and look. We get the earnings announcement. Take a peek at the option chain, see where this long spread is at based off of where we talked about it on the show, and just slowly learn and get get your handle, get a handle on how options are priced relative to the stock. And that's one of the biggest things for beginners is understanding that an option has different variables in it that affect the price. Just because the stock goes up and down doesn't necessarily mean that your option contract is going to respond exactly like you're thinking. So you need to develop realistic expectations. So, would I be looking at doing this trade outright? No, not if I'm a beginner. This is a little fairly advanced trade, and we're definitely speculating on FedEx earnings. Uh, it's exactly what this trade is. Um, but if you trade it on paper, you follow it, you're going to learn a lot along the way, and then maybe you can dip your toe in. Uh, and some of the other strategies that are just quite simple to do are like a covered call. We have a section inside the options playbook, which I, I don't have it up right now, but called the Rookie's Corner. So you can actually go to optionsplaybook.com and you can check that out. Any other questions we got, Kelly? Let's see, I think we have a few more. So I'm seeing a question from Rome. Hi, Rome. Uh, hi, guys. Is it better to trade FedEx options in a Roth IRA right now, or should I trade out of an individual stock brokerage? All right, well, uh, what, what, in other words, I guess the question is what account should I be using? Um, yeah, that's how I read it. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a couple of things. A lot of people might not know this, first of all, is that you can trade options in retirements account, retirement accounts like IRAs and Roths. Uh, that is possible it's if your brokerage firm allows it and you do have to get approved. you got to fill out an application to be able to trade in, in those type of accounts. Now, to say if you should be in a Roth or in an individual, that, that's a... That's a hard question without knowing exactly the background and, and what your level of trading is and what your focus is. But both both types of accounts, this trade could be placed in if you wanted to overall. So a uh, simple answer to it is whichever one you would like to do best. You know, obviously taxes aren't as big of an issue in Roth uh, if it's profitable, but then if it's not profitable, then uh, you're uh, obviously costing some retirement funds in a, uh, a Roth account, which is meant for retirement overall. All right. Anything else? Yeah. Kevin? Great answer, Brian. Yeah. And as a reminder, we can't give any recommendations. So that was a great answer. Um, let's see. I have a question from Murray Connerty. So Murray Connerty. Hi, Murray. Uh, Murray says, what are the differences between putting on this long call spread versus a short put spread? Okay, so it's all about managing the risk. Okay, if I'm doing a short put spread, which means I'm selling a put spread for a net credit, usually that's a neutral to bullish type strategy in that I am selling something. Instead of paying the small debit like we have here where we're paying $1.63 or $1.65 on our trade, uh, that would be a credit. In other words, you go below the marketplace sell that, try to bring in a net credit, and then you have additional risk above and beyond. So you'd actually have a margin requirement in your account, and the width of that spread is $5. So you're hoping to make $1.65, that would be your maximum, but then the most that this thing could trade for would be $5. So uh, you have a higher probability of success because you need the market to just stay where it's at or go higher. But if you're incorrect, you have much more risk on the trade. So in this instance, I would rather speculate, uh, not necessarily, I don't, you can pick what directions you, you want to pick based off of what we're looking at here. But around in earnings, I like to manage the risk where I'm paying a little and could make a lot as opposed to receiving a little and could lose a lot, right? So in, my, in the way that I would approach this type of trade, I'd rather be looking at long spreads than short spreads in general, as far as option trading is concerned. Great answer. Are we there? All right, let's see. Oh, can you hear me? Yep. Did you lose me? Yep, we're getting close to Okay, the awesome. 
All right, work from home struggles. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, Brian. So I will go with DPP. Hi, DP. Uh, let's see. Is it better to buy the call option and sell it with the same strike price, expiration date, but with higher premium price, hoping that the earnings will move the price up? Okay, same same strike. Well, yeah, I guess overall, that's kind of what we're talking about is the long call spread. I, I don't know if the question was worded uh, perfectly there, but the long call spread seems that we're buying the same expiration. We're buying a lower strike call and selling a higher strike call. Now, the concept of the long call spread overall, or otherwise known as a debit spread, is that you're using that same expiration date. So picking your expiration date is important. Obviously, we're doing this based off our earnings, so we're only going to go out 11 days in time. You need to give them a trade a little bit time time to play, play out, but the options are expensive because of earnings. And if we go out further in time, that costs you more money overall. And if you pay more, that means you have more risk on that trade. So usually our, when you're looking at long spreads, you stay in the same expiration. And the concept on the call side is that you buy the closer to the money strike call and then sell a further out of the money strike call. Awesome. I think you got that one. All right. All right. I think I think we are at time, Brian. Um, awesome. Well, thank you, everybody, for such good questions. Thank you, Brian, for walking us through everything we need to know about options and the market, especially FedEx options. I'll go ahead and wrap things up by saying that Brian will close the loop on this trade on our stock play of the day overtime episode on Friday. And the time escapes me, so you're going to have to say that, Brian. But definitely check that out. Um, we do that every single week for all the stock play of the day trades that we make. Um, and Brian usually kills it. So, yeah, check out stock play of the day overtime. Yeah, it's Friday at noon Eastern time, live, once again, yeah. uh, Friday at noon Eastern time on the Ally Invest YouTube channel. And I just want to say, just don't forget to click subscribe and ring the bell, and you'll get all the alerts for all of the stock play of the day episodes. So I'll see you this Friday. Thanks for coming, everyone.